Hello, my name is Becky. Thank you for calling Command Tower Support Line. How may I help you? Yeah, hi. So I bought the Wizards Precon deck from Commander 2017, and it just isn't doing what I want it to do against all of the hyper-competitive Commander decks that have filled up the meta at my local game store. The deck isn't working. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Have you tried unsleeving and resleeving your deck? Yeah, yeah, I did that already, and it took half an hour because I double sleeve my commander decks. Why did you have me do that in the first place? And you've checked to see whether or not you've taken the deck out of the deck box. Yes, and this has nothing to do with how my deck plays. Oh, I see. Can you please be more specific about what your deck is failing to accomplish? I want them to suffer. Um, excuse me, sir, who? My enemies. I want them to suffer. Uh, sir, you realize that Commander is a fun, casual format. Oh, I'll have fun. Oh, I see. Um, I'll have to transfer you to one of our laboratory maniacs. Please stand by. <laughs> I have you on the line, sir. I'm one of the laboratory maniacs. This call may be monitored for quality assurance purposes. How may I help you today? Ugh, I already gave you all this information. I want my enemies to suffer. I see, I see. You need a much more competitive deck. How much would you like your enemies to suffer? As much as possible. We can upgrade that deck for you with Anala as the commander. The full upgrade cost $4,000, and we do have an installment plan. Ooh, uh, no, 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 not that much. Uh, some of these people have families. We do have a $1,500 version for a slightly toned down amount of malice. You couldn't tone it down anymore, could you? Well, our $800 version will make them curse you and your firstborn child. Let's, let's leave my kid out of this. Uh, is there a cheaper option? Our lowest tier will cause an ample amount of annoyance at $500, akin to a bad rash. Perfect. I'll just sell a couple of lands from my modern deck. Excellent. You're one of the first folks to get your hands on this deck deck. Your enemies will never see it coming. Fantastic. I am so looking forward to surprising everyone and... Oh, shoot! Inala, Archmage Ritualist, is an exciting new commander from Commander 17, headlining the Wizard Tribal deck. There are many fun and casual ways to build around her, swarming your enemies with an army of wizards and interesting spells, but that's not what this video is all about. This video is about winning and winning fast, possibly even turn one. You heard me. Anala costs two generic mana, a blue, a black, and a red, and enters the battlefield as a 4-5 human wizard with two abilities. She lets you tap five untapped wizards to have target player lose seven life, but in our deck that is basically flavor text. Of more interest to us is her new Eminence ability that works even if you've never cast her. Whenever another non-token wizard enters the battle field under your control, if Anala, Archmage Ritualist, is in the command zone or on the battlefield, you may pay a single generic mana to create a token that's a copy of that wizard with haste and it will stick around until your next end step. This enables a combo that can win the game as early as turn one. Obviously, that's only with a perfect godlike hand, but it does threaten a win every single turn of the game after turn one, and is perfect for competitive commander. So what is the combo? The key to making Anala top tier is the card Wanderwine Prophets, a 4-4 Merfolk for 6. That's right, Merfolk is our key to victory here. Wonderwine Prophets reads, Champion a Merfolk, which means that when it enters the battlefield, you sacrifice it, unless you exile a Merfolk you control for as long as the Prophets are on the battlefield. Oblivion Ring style. And then, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you may sacrifice a Merfolk to take an extra turn. The combo with Anala involves more than a bit of stack tomfoolery, so bear with me on this. First, Prophets enters the battlefield. Inala's ability and the champion trigger both happen at the same time, so you get to decide on the order. Put them on the stack such that Inala's trigger happens first. Next, pay one to make a token copy of the Prophets. That token now has to champion something or die. Next, the token can champion the original, real version of Wanderwine Prophets. This means it is now exiled under the token for as long as the token 
Duncan is on the battlefield. This is now the point where you'd have to do the champion thing for the original prophets, but it's gone now, so nothing happens. The net result is that you have a hasty token version of Wanderwine prophets on the battlefield, with the original hanging out in exile. The laboratory maniacs call this trick the champion dance, because as you're about to see, we have to do it a bunch of times to turn this into a win condition. Get Wanderwine Prophets into play and do the champion dance, getting your hasty token. Go to combat and smash someone in the face, then have the token sacrifice itself to take an extra turn. When the token leaves play, the real card, which was championed, comes back. When it does, you have the opportunity to do the dance all over again, pay your one mana, and get your hasty token back with the original exiled under it, just like before. Finally, you go to your end step and now it's time to exile the token. Oh, but wait! When the token gets exiled and the original comes back, you can do the champion dance again for another mana, and since you're already past the beginning of your end step, the token will stick around until the next turn's end step. Oh, but that next turn is yours! So you start your next turn and you can attack with the profits, and then do the dance again to keep your token around. And just like that, Inala has taken a single merfolk and turned it into this never-ending stream of hasty merfolk wizards of the coast that give us extra turns, extra card draws, extra extra combat steps, and extra slaps at our opponents until they shuffle up for another game. So what makes this combo so good in competitive EDH? Odds are good that you'll have clear attacks on at least one opponent, and while you whittle them down, you're likely to find answers to any blockers in your way on your many draw steps. Also, it's a very compact win condition, requiring just the one card, which is great. Many combos require you to devote multiple slots in your deck to cards like Necrotic Ooze, or Angel of Glory's Rise that are worse than useless when you draw them before you're ready to go off. Instead, we want to have our hand filled with fast mana, interaction, and tutors to find what we need to hold off our opponents until we're ready to go. Reanimation. One thing I glossed over is actually getting Wanderwine Prophets into play. Paying the full price of six mana and then having three left over for the three Anala triggers we need to get the combo going isn't practical in a competitive EDH game. That's why we're instead Instead, aiming to use the tried and tested legacy and vintage staple strategy of reanimation. We put our powerful creatures into the graveyard and cheat them into play for far less mana than it would cost to actually cast them with cards like reanimate, animate dead, necromancy, apprentice necromancer, and dance of the dead. Running a reanimation package means that we can throw in some other sweet targets too as a backup plan if we can't pull off the main combo. The ultimate creature to reanimate that's legal in EDH is Gingitaxis. With his CMC of 10, Gingitaxis is one of the most mana intensive cards out there. But if we can get him into play, we certainly get our mana's worth. He has flash and reads at the beginning of your end step, draw seven cards. Each opponent's maximum hand size is reduced by seven. So not only does he draw us a bunch of cards at the end of our turn, he forces all of our opponents to discard their hand at the end of theirs. Outside of our lovely blue Praetor, we have Sire of Insanity as another reanimation target target that lets us attack our opponent's hands. With his ability to make everyone discard their hands on each end step, this sneaky demon is one of our strongest comeback tools. The other half of reanimating creatures is getting them into the graveyard first and fast. Having our reanimation targets in our hand isn't a great feeling, but we have several ways to keep that from happening. From the classics of Entomb and Frantic Search to the more modern staple of Faithless Looting. We run a number of ways to filter cards from our hand to the graveyard or to pull them from our library and send them six feet under. These enable our reanimation spells to replace those high CMC cards in hand with cheaper spells that we can cast comfortably. Legacy staples like Brainstorm, Ponder, and Preordain are additional cantrips that will help us find what we need, and if all that fails, we've got a bunch of tutors to more directly get us what we're missing, such as Demonic Tutor and Gamble, which actually are very good bang for our buck. Interaction. But with all this reanimation fun we're having, let's not forget that we do also have opponents and they're going to be doing equally sneaky things to win. 
In Competitive Commander, you're likely going to see Turn 1 Hermit Druids, Ad Nauseums, and Food Chains, left and right. We want to be able to stop our opponents. It doesn't matter if it is their plan we're stopping or if it's them trying to stop us. They need to stop whatever it is they're doing. If a creature is giving us trouble, let's terminate it. We can also make use of Simic Science and Rapid Hybridization. Even Reality Shifting that pesky thing out of existence is an option here. If something on the stack is causing us pain, we also have plenty of ways to deal with that. A whole suite of counter spells from actual literal counter spell, with the ability to counter anything for two blue mana, to more narrow counter spells like Gate, which lets us counter any non-creature spell for a quick and easy one and a blue. Even the cheaper and more volatile red magics of Red Elemental Blast and Pyroblast can aid us in deciding any battle on the stack in our favor by allowing us to either counter a blue spell or destroy a blue permanent for a single red mana. Ramp. When it comes to ramp, we're running a slightly different and more low-to-the-ground setup than many other decks. There's no Gilded Lotus or Thran Dynamo to be found here. We are looking for artifacts that are cheap, two mana or less, come in untapped and give us either colored mana or more mana than they cost. Yes, that means Soul Ring is part of our ramp package, but we're also running its cheaper and younger twin, Mana Crypt. Both tap for two colorless and can push us to three to four mana on turn two, which is just where we want to be. We also have all the signets in our colors representing the Demir, Izzet, and Rakdos guilds of Ravnica. These cost two, require a mana of any color to tap, and then produce one mana for each color of the their guild. Blue and black for Demir, blue and red for Izzet, and black and red for Rakdos. Not only do the Signets ramp us, but they also provide valuable mana fixing, making it notably easier to cast our more color-intensive spells. For example, Rakdos Signet helps us to cast our Rakdos Charm off a single untapped island. Since quick mana development is so key to our strategy, we even play some of the zero mana artifacts. Chrome Mox and Lotus Petal. Chrome Mox lets us imprint a non-land, non-artifact card from our hand to tap for one mana of the imprinted card's color, which means that we get ourselves ahead of turn on mana at the cost of an additional land. Lotus Petal gets us one mana one time. It may seem like it isn't worth it, but in competitive EDH, that one turn makes all the difference. Putting our Wanderwine Profits into play one turn earlier can mean the difference between a win or a loss. Games are often decided as early as turns three to four, and making our plans faster means we get to sneak into that winning time frame. Let's move on to our mana base. We have a three-color commander, and while the principles from how to build a three-color EDH deck do apply here, there's going to be some very notable changes for the competitive scene. With so much action packed into the first few turns of the game, having any lands coming in tapped is a death sentence, and we can't afford to stumble on colors. So we're playing fetch lands like Wooded Foothills and Flooded Strand that only fetch for one of our colors. And yes, since they're colorless and don't have any mana symbols, you can do this. Since our shock lands, like Watery Grave, have two land types, we can fetch up whatever colors we need in the early game. We also have City of Brass, Mana Confluence, and Tarnished Citadel. All lands that let you tap for any color of mana but require you to pay life to make it happen. We round out the color balance by including some pain lands in the form of Underground River and Shivan Reef. Note that we don't have the third of that cycle, Sulfurous Springs, and that is for color balance reasons. We desperately need blue mana in our deck, and we want all of our non-fetchable duels to produce a blue at minimum. The last step in finishing our mana base is with a large helping of basic islands, a few swamps, and no mountains. We have enough dual lands to cover our red mana needs. Our last land of note is our only utility land in the deck, and it's one for our reanimation enabling. Desolate Light house, which taps for a colorless or for one generic mana, a red and a blue, we draw a card and discard a card. This being a land means we can get around most counter spells and can throw our Jinja Taxis or Wanderwine Prophets into the grave and replace it with another card. Playing Anala in competitive EDH is a challenging and intriguing venture. It gives us access to the most powerful spells and some of the most explosive strategies. We have cantrips to smooth out our draws and a giant suite of interaction to weave our plan together while fighting through everything else at the table. Choosing the right moment to enact our master plan can be a challenge, but when we get our profits into play, we get to listen to the wails of despair as our commander, waiting in the wings, watches her devious magic being set in motion. 
I hope very much this deck tech has been of some help to you. Do you like competitive commander decks? Well, then you're going to love the laboratory maniacs who worked with me in developing this video and this deck list. Go see their non-budget builds of this and other competitive commander decks by following the link in this video's description. Seriously, for all things competitive commander, the laboratory maniacs are who you want to check out. And this program was made possible thanks to a sponsorship from Card Kingdom, as well as the Patreon support of viewers such as you. So thank you.